Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's quick webinar on CFD for ventilation system design. My name is David. Um, I'm CEO and co-founder here of SimSkill, CFD engineer by training. And um, before we start into this session, I'd quickly get some organizational things out of the way. Um, we're using GoToWebinar to stream this uh, session today, and it has a feature where you can ask questions. So at any point in time during the, um, the session today, you can just type in your question, and I'll make sure that by the end of the session, I'll um, cover some of those. Experience shows that most of the time it's too many to cover all of them, but I'll, I'll do my best to cover um, at least a, a few of them. Um, we also do record this webinar, so you should be, um, you should get an email in the next 24 hours with that uh, recording that you can um, review parts of it or uh, send it to colleagues um, if you like to do so. Um, yeah, that being said, uh, let's stick into it. The session today was motivated by um, us seeing many customers, many um, lots of interest in the design or in, in the usage of CFD uh, for the design of such ventilation systems. Um, so a quick note on why you should care at all about um, CFD in, in, in the design of such ventilation systems. And what we most of the time see customers um, concerned with is two, two scenarios where the ventilation system um, just needs to work properly, right? The first one is um, the management of some pollutant. Most of the time it's carbon monoxide in enclosures, uh, in enclosed parking garages. Um, in other facilities, we sometimes see other things in clean rooms, for example, but in enclosed parking garages, it's really most of the time carbon monoxide concentration um, that you want to manage to make sure that um, there's no hazard for any occupants in that um, in that space. The second scenario is oftentimes smoke clearance where, you know, some car burns within the garage or some other source of fire is happening. Um, you have a smoke production locally and you want to ensure that the removal of that smoke is fast enough um, and um, the visibility in that space is ensured during such a scenario. On the right you can see two different garages. Um, that you can also find under the public projects in SimScale. We, we're looking at the velocity plots of different ventilation systems here. We dig, we dig into that um, later a bit. But what it comes down to is really that um, lots of um, such designs, lots of such projects are subject to some sort of regulatory requirement, right? It really, it highly depends on the country you're in, the location you're in, um, and in, in that location, you oftentimes have some sort of building code you need to comply with. And the beauty of CFD is that both of these scenarios can be um, predicted, or the performance in both of these scenarios can be visualized and predicted just based on a digital representation of your design, right? Just on your computer-aided design model, you can see whether or not your ventilation system performs as expected and whether or not you will comply with um, the building code, the standard um, that you're subject to, that the project is subject to. Um, and that, that's what really what it comes down to, right? So we're seeing customers succeeding by making sure in an early design phase that um, their ventilation system designs uh, performs as they want it to, um, to avoid costly design changes later um, in the design process of such a building. Yeah, that being said, what we're going to look at today um, in more detail is the first scenario, right? A carbon monoxide concentration inside an enclosed um, parking garage, right? We also have um, projects, or we've also seen projects with garages um, that are, you know, multi-level garages outside where you also um, have smoke clearance or some fire scenarios you want to look at. But... Um, in the enclosed space, um, carbon monoxide production is a big um, is a big concern for designers. So we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in some more detail um, today. Quick look at carbon monoxide levels. Um, this is a little excerpt from an Ashray um, paper. On the right, you can see some just a rough overview of a couple of standards, couple of building codes, um, where you can see what regulatory requirements exist. Um, so the first column shows the time 
um, a, um, an occupant is exposed to the carbon monoxide level. And on the right, we can see parts per million ppm, right? And so what, what we're looking at is most of the time um, a, a long-term exposure limit. So that's the one on the left. So um, most of the time, eight hours. Um, and so on the right, you can see it's called LTEL, long-term exposure limit. Um, so for eight hours, it's okay to have nine ppm in the in the space, right? And then the other number we're oftentimes looking at, depending on the code, is a short-term exposure limit to carbon monoxide, um, and that is most of the time shorter. Um, you know, different different times exists here, and then um, it can be higher, but only um, for a shorter amount of time. So that's sort of the 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 legal or regulatory constraint or frame in which we're operating, right? And so keeping this now in mind, um, we want to look at, we want to see sense kill in action, right? We want to see, um, okay, how does that look and feel? Um, how do results look like? And how can I, as a design engineer of such a system, uh, benefit from it? One thing before um, we dig into this, um, the session today is really meant just to give you a super crisp overview over, you know, how does the process look like, what SimScale can do, what SimScale can't do, um, for you to judge whether or not that's a tool you want to dig into deeper. Um, today we won't cover, you know, the details of turbulence theory or um, the detailed workflow in SimScale, mesh generation, these sorts of things. We won't cover those. There's, there's um, lots of other learning content available that you can um, review, but today it's really just about the, the case why you should run, uh, why such simulations uh, matter, right, and why they are helpful. All right, the design scenario we're looking at is this garage, right? So we have an enclosed garage um, on the ground and um, it's subject, subject to some, you know, design constraints. So we're having, you can see it already here on the left, we have the, um, the, the ramp here where the cars are coming in. Let me quickly see if I can draw something here. So we have the ramp over here, right? Um, we're going to see in a second that we have um, fresh air um, here and over here, I think. Um, and then we have the only option where we can put exhaust um, outlets is over here, right? We're going to see that in a second in more detail. So that's sort of the constraints under which we're operating. But the biggest constraint um, is, let me quickly go back, is the carbon monoxide production, right? The scenario we want to look at is really an extreme scenario. Um, so it's really the short-term exposure limit, right? So we're assuming in that in that garage um, that the, the capacity is roughly 200 cars. And so typically what we've seen um, in, for example, garages in stadiums, right, after a, a, a game is over, um, we're looking typically at 20 to 25 percent moving cars, but here we want to take it one step further, and we're assuming 40 percent of the total car capacity is moving. Um, so that makes 80 moving cars, arguably an extreme case, but you know, it's simulation, so we can, <laughs> we can just uh, do that. Um, and we're assuming a certain amount of uh, carbon monoxide production per car, and that overall carbon monoxide production is assumed as a volume source of carbon monoxide across the entire uh, garage, right? We've seen customers modeling that differently. Some model, you know, sort of a, the lanes and on the, on the driving lanes, the, only the carbon monoxide production is happening. Others are choosing local spots, et cetera. So there's all sorts of different uh, ways of modeling it. Today, we're going we're gonna to assume it's evenly distributed across the domain. Um, let me quickly make sure that no urgent questions pop up. That looks good. Um, and so, as I said, our fresh air supply is constrained by the system. And so now as a design engineer, we're choosing, just as a, as a first guess, we're saying, okay, from our experience, it makes sense if we, if we put in three fresh air supplies here on the right, one fresh air supply over there, all of them 18,000 um, cubic meters per hour uh, air movement. And then the same goes for um, where the... Uh, the air moves out. Here in the top, we can see three mechanically ventilated exhaust openings, um, each of them 28,000 or roughly 29,000 cubic meters per hour. And then here in the lower left, we can see the ramp open, inlet, outlet, so there is no, no mechanical ventilation happening here. That's the scenario we're looking at. And what we're interested in or what we're concerned with is 
under these conditions, um, and assuming these conditions, you know, stay for a couple of minutes, let's say even an hour after, a, let's assume in a, in, a, in a football stadium, is the the short-term exposure limit of 200 parts per uh, per million ppm, is it maintained, right? Is it, um, is it kept? And that's sort of really the design challenge we're facing, right? Are our ventilation performance specifics, um, sort of ventilation systems we put in here, are they up for the job? Um, will they produce a carbon monoxide level that is under the regulatory threshold? And if not, or if it's, you know, borderline, should we add jet fans? Um, that's the second scenario we're going to look at. So we could bring in jet fans into that domain to sort of um, help the ventilation system or to help the removal um, of carbon monoxide to keep it under the regulatory threshold. And if yes, where to place them, right? Um, Obviously, each of those jet fans will consume energy. Um, the, the fewer we use, and all of them produce noise, so the fewer we use, the better. And so we're interested in placing them ideally. All right, that's, that's the challenge <laughs> as, as, a, as an engineer in such a scenario. And what we want to look at is how SimSkill can now help to do such a design job or to get such a design job done. Before we do so, few words about why SimScale, right? Um, there's a ton of CVD software out there, um, all sorts of systems and all sorts of hardware. Um, so why SimScale? Why another um, piece of piece of CVD software? What we set out to is we wanted to build a, a CVD solution that's first and foremost um, ultimately accessible. That means SimScale runs in a normal web browser. We do not want our customers to being forced to buy lots of local hardware, to be constrained by the local hardware, um, etc. So no local hardware, no local software, everything runs in a web browser. Second piece is we want people to to tap into that um, you know without a huge fixed investment in terms of money. So um, you can start actually using SimScale for free in the community plan. Um, once you go on a professional level you can choose how much computing quota you need. So we really try to tailor the usage of SimScale to, to the specific need of a customer. Last but not least, um, we've built in all sorts of mechanisms that um, shall help also, um, you know, not so frequent users of CFD to be successful with it. And that starts with a large community that's active on SimScale and there to help, that goes on with um, real-time support inside the application, sharing um, capability inside the application where you can work with our support or with your clients or with, um, with, with colleagues in real time on the same simulation project. So that's what we, what we set out to do. And we're going to see that in action in, in a second. Here's a rough overview over um, the workflow. We're going to see that in action in a second. But the workflow all the time looks uh, very, very similar. Right? You open up a web browser. You bring in your CAT model, where um, our customer base is using all sorts of CAT model. We, uh, first and foremost, support general exchange formats in terms of CAT data, STEP, IGES, STL, and the likes. Um, and we're adding also now, almost a, no, rather on a monthly basis, new proprietary formats. Um, so we just recently uh, supported SolidWorks, Autodesk Inventor, um, and there's more formats on the horizon, particularly also for the AEC space that will release shortly. Inside the application, then, you have the ability to specify the physics of your particular case, and you run it, and then you visualize um, the result fields and make your design decision accordingly. I mean, today we're particularly interested in such a uh, carbon monoxide per ventilation simulation, right? Um, but SimScale in general is a general purpose CFD tool. So it starts from in the top left. You can see an incompressible flow simulation around the car. So low velocity, low temperature flows. Top right, you can see a free surface flow where both the air and the water and the interface between is modeled around a ship hull. In the lower left, you can see a turbo machinery application, so it also supports rotating frames, these sorts of things. In the lower right, that goes close to what we're doing today, um, also convective heat transfer, um, so where you have um, yeah, simply buoyancy effects in your flow, these sorts of things. Um, so it's really, it's not just a, um, a CFD tool for the AEC sector, but it goes beyond that. All right, enough talk. Um, let's take a look at how that looks like, right? And for that, we're quickly going to exit the presentation, bring in over a new browser window, and take a look at the application itself. Um, so as I said, SimScale is really a, 
just a web application, right? So you go to simscale.com, there's a bunch of information on our website. You can create an, an, an account in the, in the top right if you're signed out. If you're signed in as I am, you can directly jump to your dashboard. And here I can see, you know, the simulation projects I'm working on, and this is the, the project, we're gonna, project we're going to look at today, right? A pollutant extraction. Um, and there we are. This is uh, now the SimScale workbench itself. And so here we can see um, I brought in a CAD model as a step model, right? So I modeled that in, a, in, my, in my local CAD software, and that customers were, were seeing oftentimes using here AutoCAD or Revit, um, Rhino, um, and yeah, most of the other popular CAD systems in the in the architecture space. And so I brought it in as a step model. Um, that's the in, that's basically the 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 air enclosure, right? So the air um, the air volume, if you will. And um, how that then looks like is you um, you generate a mesh, and that's what I've already done here. So let's turn on quickly the mesh view here. So face, zoom in a little bit. And this is now um, a finite volume mesh that I'm going to use to run that CFD analysis on. And you can see that that, um, that space took quite a few of those cells to be, um, to be resolved well. In fact, it's, a, it's roughly 5 million finite volume cells. So that's quite a mesh, right? On a local computer, that would be on a normal local computer, the, the generation of such a mesh would not be trivial, but then the solving of such an application, um, you know, requires quite some, quite some hardware simply, right? And here, it's it's a simple web application, so you don't have any heavy lifting on your local computer. All right, and just to give you a feel for um, for now how such a setup looks like, so I define my air properties, right? So in that case, I assign and to, and to, to the entire domain, I assign um, air as a as a Newtonian fluid. And then the next piece um, is I define, as we discussed, right, my three, uh, my three inlets where I bring in fresh air, all of them with five cubic meters per second. And you can see them highlighted here and over here, right? Here is where my fresh air enters. My, then my mechanically ventilated outlet is, is over here, right? One, two, three, where I'm saying, okay, I'm, I'm sucking the air out with minus eight, um, uh, cubic meters per second and then last but not least I'm having over here the um, my uh, the open outlet the, the ramp where cars can enter and, and leave the space and that's basically it right I mean then there's I have the passive scalar source applied to the entire domain as we discussed um, which is a which is a, a relative value and that's about it right and then I I'm running it in the cloud. In that case, I ran that on, let's take a look. I ran that on 96 cores, um, that simulation. So 96 cores is quite a computer, right? Not a lot of people have 96 cores in hardware um, sitting in their office. Typically, only specialized companies have something like that. And on SimScale, it's a, you know you just choose it as a machine, right? You have, there's, you have different ones that you can choose if you have a smaller job. But the, the beauty is you do not have to to, to pay for that hardware sitting in your basement and, and getting old, right? It's really just, you use it when you need to. That's that's what it comes down to. Uh, all right, so I run it in the cloud, and then I, in that case, I did, um, I did post-processing, um, you know, inside the application. I also downloaded it in afterwards, and did some um, local screenshots. And the result interpretation we're gonna do in the presentation, so I'm quickly jumping back here. And what I do get is what we ran here is a steady state analysis of that scenario. So we're not looking at, you know, um, how exactly the it's produced and how the carbon monoxide moves through the space. But what we're interested in is let's assume that scenario, this production of carbon monoxide, this um, ventilation of carbon monoxide is happening for a reasonably long time that the system comes into a stationary status, a steady state, right, where the system doesn't change with time anymore. That's what we're looking at. Um, without going too much into the physics, it was a, a fully turbulent uh, simulation. So we used the RANS turbulence model to account for turbulent effects. And um, what we're now looking at, what we're mainly interested in is first is the air movement, right? So we can see that as we would expect, our fresh air 
mechanically ventilated space generates quite a draft over here. So we're seeing the, the air moves um, from the bottom to the top here. And then here at the top where we're bringing the other one, we also have a high velocity, right? And then sort of a global vortex, if you will, around this, um, this hole in the middle here is being generated, right? And we can see that we have quite some air sort of movement over here, and that's what we like, right? Let's quickly get the, the pen over here. So what I what I like to see is right here, this is good, and so here it's directly sucked out. So I, I would assume that in this entire region here, right, so we're bringing it in here, we're there, um, and then even here, we've got good air movement, and um, I would assume that not a lot of carbon monoxide um, is left here, right? That's simply swept out. Um, that's a good piece. What I'm... What I'm concerned about is are these regions, right? So we're having sort of very almost no velocity, almost no air movement over here. And so we have carbon, we have the, the danger that carbon monoxide is being located here and not being sweeped out, swept out. And that's a um, that could be an issue. So let's see. Uh, quickly deleting that one. And let's take a look at um, the carbon monoxide uh, PPMs here. So we can see this is now PPM, and we're going up to, I think it's 163 in that region. So that's, like, as we would have expected, on those areas, right, no carbon monoxide is left, everything is swept out. But in those regions where we didn't have a lot of air movement, this is something we might take care of, right, or that's that's concerning. Let, let me put it that way. What we said, keep in mind, we said 200 parts per million in a um, 200 ppm in a in a sort of short amount of time, right? So we're actually kind of good, right? But for um, for the sake of this demonstration, we're saying, okay, that's too risky. So we want to be sure that um, that we're meeting that requirement. So it's 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 for us too risky. So we want to get that that down, right? So what are our options? Um, uh, quickly, re quickly revisiting that, right? I mean, now the two fields uh, side by side, so I can see clearly the um, the where I have these this low velocities. I can see that carbon monoxide is being um, sort of located and where it's it's able to accumulate and then to concentrate higher. And that's a danger. Um, so we want to get rid of that. And that's what we're going to do. And so there's, you know, different different systems. We could now think about ducting, et cetera. For, for the sake of this session today, what we're interested in is jet fans, right? So what we're going to do is we want to place jet fans. So we, and looking at this, at this chart or at this visualization of the velocity field, what I want to do is over here I have a large low velocity field, not a lot of air movement. So I want to make sure that I have enough jet fans over here that produce a another um, air movement to towards the exhaust openings on the right. Same goes over here. Um, I'm thinking about the same direction because I can I, I want to bring this air also I want to connect it to that stream, also bring it over here, last piece in the lower left, right? That's sort of my, the guidance, I mean, arguably that's not an optimization, right? I don't have now a software sort of uh, producing the ideal location for the parking, eh, for the for the jet fans, but it gives me a guidance where I as a designer should place um, the jet fans. And um, this is what I decided to do. I'm placing six jet fans with a particularly, with a particular performance in these areas, right? Keep in mind, we had the, um, we had this, this big low velocity area over here. I want to make sure that the air from the top left here is also brought um, over to the exhaust openings and the same in the lower right. And that's what we're going to do, right? We, so what, I, what we did in the preparation of this webinar is simply running the exact same simulation with the difference of having these six jet fans being modeled in there. And that's what it looks like, right? So that's a cut section through the parking garage with the jet fans on the height of the jet fans, so 2.8 meters in that case, um, to, to just see the effect of these of these jet fans, right? And so I can see clearly where they are located. Um, again, let's quickly highlight that one. So I'm bringing this out of that area over here. I'm bringing it over here. And the important piece is here. Right? We could even discuss if we shouldn't place these jet fans a little bit more to the left, right? But again, I mean, that's... That's just one iteration. Um, quickly erase that. 
And as an effect, this is now the same color scale for carbon monoxide uh, PPM than we used before. So we can see none of the areas has this red north of 160 PPM carbon monoxide concentration left. We only are in a green level, so we're somewhere at 80. I think the max is, we're going to look at it later, I think something like 76 or something like that. So these jet fans significantly improved the situation, right? We could now still, you know, go back and say, hey, why don't we add, like bring the this one jet fan a bit more down? Um, but for the for the sake of demonstration, I think it, it I think the point should be clear. Um, again, a side by side comparison, velocity field and carbon monoxide concentration. We can see we reduce these areas with high carbon monoxide concentration, just as we as we would have expected. So that's a, that's a good piece. Now let's let's really look at this side by side. These are so on the left design one, the initial one on the right with jet fans, right? Now with a higher velocity scale. And we can see that the again the area of low velocity is completely erased, right? Uh, looking at this now, I think in a third iteration, I would move these these jet fans, these two, still a little bit to the left. But that's again would be a third iteration. But we can see that we have good movement now everywhere. Um, then a side by side comparison um, of these guys, right? We saw them before, and you can see the values now on in on the bottom. So from 164 ppm, we brought it down to roughly 74. And now visualize differently, that's now on a lock scale on 1.8 meters. On left to the right, again, we can see the red areas vanish, so we're better off. And this is a visualization where we're looking at 60 ppm. Um, you could also now change that to say, okay, hey, um, I want to, um, I want a scenario where I'm getting below 50 or 40, so that's up to you, but we can see none of it, none of the areas are significantly north of 60 ppm after we brought in the jet fans. Let's put a number on this, 55% um, with the jet fans, and in that case, again, we could look at, you know, we introduced energy consumption, uh, we would need to look at the, at the job specifics, does that make sense? I'm not saying that that we should always add jet fans or something. I think the beauty of this is that we can make informed design decisions based on a CAD design. You bring in a CAD design and you can see how your ventilation uh, system design will perform. Let's wrap this up. Um, at this point, I'm, I almost could stick to the 20 minutes. <laughs> not, not entirely, but almost. What we did here is sort of the, the setup of such a simulation you could see, right, is um, it, it requires some time to prepare the CAD model um, because oftentimes, you know, you, you typically don't model the um, the air, the air envelope, but you model the actual building, right? So that might uh, take some time. But then the actual setup of uh, the mesh generation, the setup of the physics is, is almost trivial, right? You bring it in, um, there's lots of automation in SimScale. Uh, so overall, including, um, including post-processing, et cetera, it's a couple of hours manual time thanks to a 96 core machine that handles a 5 million mesh um, with ease. It was just around eight hours computing time um, in roughly 700, uh, north of 700 core hours that we that we invested here, right? Um, and what we got from it is that just based on initial design of such a parking lot, we can we have d simply confidence in this design, right? We know detailed how our ventilation system is going to perform compared to regulatory requirements. So are we going to meet them or not, right? Simply this design confidence we, we get by this. We avoid costly design changes um, at some point downstream. Don't take my word for it. Um, the, the the nice thing about SimScale is that it's um, it's a web application, and so that means you can just test that yourself, right? So you can just go ahead and um, and uh, create an account um, and yeah, take SimScale for a spin yourself. Um, you can do that in a professional trial where you can run private projects, or you do it in a community plan where you can um, use it for free, but in a but just for public projects. So that's something I'd, I'd encourage you to do. And with that, um, thank you very much for uh, spending time to, today with us. And let's take a look at some of the questions. I need to manage uh, expectations here. It's already way too much. <laughs> it's a lot, so that's great. Um, but we probably cannot um, um, we cannot cover uh, all of them. So I'm just going to take a look at, at some of those. Um, oh, yeah. 
Okay, I'll try to, to cover just a few. <laughs> uh, so, sorry, I'm, I'm not the best person to read and uh, talk at the same time. Um, so one attendee asks, um, how do you give estimation of the initial carbon monoxide concentration? I didn't dive into the details of the um, of the specific simulation setup, but what's, what SimScale allows you to do is um, not just define boundary conditions, but also initial conditions, right? So you can also say, I am interested in the simulation starting with a particular uniform carbon monoxide concentration, let's say, I don't know, uh, just a 50 ppm or 150 ppm. Um, or you can also go ahead and, and specify a local um, carbon monoxide concentration in some subdomain, in some part of the, of the garage. But we didn't do that today, or we didn't pay attention to this today, because what we did today is we just looked at a steady state simulation, right? Um, so what this means is that we assume the system to be um, not changing with time anymore, right? And the and we see customers doing both things. So sometimes um, there's there's even building codes or regulatory re requirements that ask for transient analysis, um, for, so for for not stationary simulations, where initial conditions are much more important, right? So there you would say, okay, my parking garage starts with that, um, with that I don't know level of smoke concentration or with a fire or you know you name it, and then you started the simulation process. But since we looked at a steady state analysis today, the initial conditions are not as important. In fact, they are only important um, for you to gain a, a, a simulation result faster. Right. So the closer you are with your initial condition to the um, final result, um, the faster you'll get your your simulation results. I hope that answers the question. Um, one registrant asks uh, whether or not the um, you would model some cars or all cars. And let's quickly go back to this one. Um, so should we should we model just a subset of cars, all cars, or um, or no cars? And the, I, I uh, I'm afraid I need I need to give the general engineering answer on this that goes it depends, right? <laughs> so the um, we, what we see customers doing is really it really depends on the code you want to comply with um, or if it's maybe sometimes it's also done for optimization purposes because um, uh, people want to optimize some sort of you know a clean room or, or in that case the, uh, the, the smoke extraction um, I think it's really an engineering judgment whether or not the cars are um, important for the air movement or, or not I mean in this case I just flipped back to that slide to, to show you here I mean the cars were modeled with with a significant detail I would say we also see see that being done both more sophisticated and less sophisticated um, We've seen all sorts of models, and ultimately it comes down to, I mean, the more you include in your simulation, the more accurate it'll be, but it's obviously a trade-off uh, with your computational requirements, right? So it's going to take longer to run that simulation, and um, it really depends on the project. So I'm afraid I cannot give a, a general answer to that. Um, it depends on the code, and it depends on the project um, you work on, but the nice thing about it is that you you can do at any point in time, right? Um, and you. SimScale gives you the computing power that's necessary to do so. Um, one one uh, attendee asks, um, is the CAT model a solid? Um, yes, it is. Uh, let's quickly jump to, so what the, you, you can see really that what I, what I brought into SimScale is a watertight model of the air envelope, right? of the air um, enclosure, if you will. So sort of the negative of what you would model. There are other ways on SimScale to also bring in a positive model and do a um, and do a simulation on it. But the, the fastest and most straightforward workflow is when you bring in a solid model of the air envelope. And then it's just from that, it, from, starting from there, it's a piece of cake. Yep, one, one um, attendee asks whether or not you can run steady state, um, uh, only steady state analysis or transient. Um, I think I touched it before quickly. You can run both. And in fact, I think the, um, the, 
the, the one of the big advantages of SimScale is that typically transient analysis are so costly that oftentimes you don't have the, lo the local computing power to support them, right, to simply run them. Because even if you have, it blocks the computer and other colleagues actually want to use it, et cetera, et cetera. And in SimScale, you just, you know, kick it off, you close your browser, you go home, um, and you can even check it on your iPad and at home what, what's happening because the, the heavy lifting is done elsewhere. So yes, you can run transient analysis. Uh, one registrant asks how the how our service scales with the computing power. Um, try to try to be crisp here. <laughs> Fundamentally, we try to provide the customer with what makes sense um, to him, right? So we've got customers. Today, we just looked at the CFD, at the flow simulations uh, capabilities we provided SimScale, right? But in fact, you can also run FEA analysis on SimScale, so structural mechanics uh, simulations. And in there, particularly the simple things such as linear elasticity analysis, et cetera, they re require very little computing uh, time, right? And so these are sort of, this is the one end of the, the scale of customers we're having that, you know, are running linear elastic simulations that really don't need a lot of computing power. And on the very, on the very other end, we're having, I mean, what we looked at today is not even the, the other end, but we've got customers that are running transient multi-phase flow simulations um, that require, you know, tens of thousands of core hours um, per simulation. And we always try to um, provide a, uh, provide the customer with a package that makes sense. So obviously the more, the more computing um, uh, power a customer needs, um, the the more um, the lower is the price per unit of computing time. Um, and the the other scenario is we don't want the customer you know to to purchase computing power he ultimately doesn't need, right? So we always try to fit um, the the package the customer uh, takes to to his specific needs. Um, and the, the fundamental mechanism is that there's a, a, a subscription, like a, an annual subscription, you know, that covers the support cost, access to the software, um, you know, all data management, these sorts of uh, these sorts of things. And then there's the, the computing power that where you can decide whether how much how much you need. Um, all right, I'll let's do two more questions. <laughs> We're really running um, running over time here. Um, one. One registrant asks, um, is it only carbon monoxide that we can model or um, are there other um, gases or species we can model? Um, I think there would be a longer. So there's, there's many different um, analysis types on SimScale, but what we did today is we used a, a passive scalar approach um, to model that analysis, right? And that means that um, the species, carbon monoxide or, you know, you name it, um, is behaves physically very similar to air, right, or to 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 the gas in which it it's being transported, and then there's diffusion. There's a diffusive con transport and a convective transport happening to to that uh, passive species, but um, this, so whenever you can make the assumption that your species wh whose transport you want to model or who you want to simulate behaves physically similar to air then you can use that approach. If this is not the case, let's say you have particles, you know, that, that have weight or, um, you know, you name it, then you would need another, um, another analysis type. All right, and then um, last, uh, last question that uh, I hope it's, it's fine. I couldn't cover all of them, uh, but I just would cover this last question. And to everyone where, where I, couldn't, we, I couldn't now answer the question, my email address is in the... Um, in the details of this webinar um, that has been sent to you, um, or also the, um, you know, our, you know, you can find contact information on simscale.com, so make sure to reach out, um, would really, uh, would love to talk and, and sort of look at, look at your particular uh, interest. Um, the last question is, um, if the compute power is priced per core hour, um, and the short answer is yes, the, we, we try to make this uh, in a way where the customer really, you know, he he just pays for the uh, for the computing time he needs. And there's there is a um, a model we use to do that, and we're happy to you know to talk more details um, on the phone. The um, where we try to fit again this package to the customer's needs, where he doesn't um, you know like add, buy tens of thousands of core hours he ultimately does need, but just the packages he needs. So yes, ultimately the price comes down to to the to the core hour exactly. All right, um, 
And so with that, I'll wrap the, up the session uh, for today. We've got lots of um, other demos coming up, webinars coming up, where we cover similar uh, similar applications, and uh, there's lots of learning uh, content on simscale.com. Uh, so I'd love to um, I'd love to see you in the community to uh, you know to, to to talk about your particular project. And with that, again, thank you very much for spending time with us today, and have a great day. Bye bye.